to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB reading series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. It was great. We had people from all over the world uh, trying to think of all the countries we had. South Africa, Pakistan, Canada, uh, Canada yes, UK. Um, oh, help me out, Australia, uh, ev everywhere, like all over the place, Barbados. It was pretty fantastic. Um, but now we're in person, and uh, while I miss getting all the great comments from people all over the world and, and people watching us live on YouTube, uh, it's really great to be in person and see everyone. So, uh, yeah, Fantastic Fiction and KGB is a monthly reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month. We've been going since the late 90s. It was started by Terry Bisson and Alice K. Turner. And um, then, who else hosted it? Uh, Gavin Grant was hosting it with Ellen Datlow. And then Gavin couldn't do it anymore, and I stepped in for Gavin. I've been doing it for, I don't know, 12 or more years. Uh, we really, this series is great, and it's free. We, they don't, we never charge a cover. The only thing we ask, the only thing we ask is that you buy a drink, hard or soft, and tip your bartenders. They're working hard to keep you hydrated, so please, if you can, just, just support the KGB bar. You support the bar, you support the series, so that's all we ask. Um, I'm very excited about our readers tonight. We have a... a uh, uh, a multiple of Davids here tonight. Uh, we have Mercurio David Rivera and David Leo Rice reading for us tonight. Uh, both of them have read for us before, but not for a long time. Uh, so I think that'll be great. Both of them also have books for sale. Um, David Leo Rice has Drifters, which is your, it's just your short story collection, correct? Yeah. And then uh, Mercurio D. Rivera has Worgen the Alien Love War. So. Uh, we hope you'll check that out. Um, also, upcoming in uh, 2022, by the way, happy holidays. 2022, next month, January 19, we, ha we have Tochi Anyabuchi and Sarah Pinsker, so we hope you'll join us for that. February 16th, the great N.K. Jemison will be reading for us with Brooke Bolander. March 16th is our favorite guest, TBA. April 20th, Victor Laval and Robert Freeman Wexler. May 18th, Grady Hendrix and Alex Irvine. So please join us for those. Um, yeah, we really appreciate you coming out. I know these days coming out to something in person, live, an event is a, is a big deal. So we, we totally appreciate that and we, we are grateful for, for you attending. Uh, our first reader tonight is Mercurio D. Rivera. So, um, full disclosure, Mercurio is a friend of mine. I've known him for a long time. I uh, can't tell you exactly how many years, but it's been a lot. Very quiet guy, came into the uh, writer's group I'm in. Um, and uh, I was like, who is this guy? Why, he's so quiet, what, something mysterious about him, something I don't like. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, he's, a, he's an awesome guy and, and um, He's an attorney by day, and uh, by night he's a, he's a science fiction writer. And his science fiction stories, um, he, he wrote, he's, he's written a lot of stories about these aliens called Worgens. And one of the things that makes these aliens interesting is that they are chemically fascinated with humans. What that means is they can't help but fall in love with any human they see. And of course, humans do what they would do in any situation where someone loves them, is they abuse them. And it is, he explores all the myriad ways in which humans and Worgens interact. And it's, the way I read it, and you might read it differently, is all the different various metaphors for human relationships. 
human romantic relationships. And the book that he's written here, Wergen, The Alien Love War, is basically a collection of all of his short stories um, collected into, into a novel. And what makes the story so fascinating is just exploring all these different myriad ways in which humans both love and abuse love. Uh, so here's Mercury de Rivera's bio. Mercury de Rivera's short fiction has been nominated for the World Fantasy Award and has won the annual Reader's Award for the Asimov's and Interzone magazines, respectively. His work has also appeared in venues such as Analog, Lightspeed, io9, Nature, Black Static, and numerous anthologies and year's best collections. His new novel, Wergen, The Alien Love War, tells stories of unrequited love set against the backdrop of humanity's complicated relationship with enigmatic aliens afflicted with a biochemical infatuation for humanity. His story, Beyond the Tattered Veil of Stars, was recently podcast by Dust Studios and features Jillian Jacobs of Community, if you watch that show, and Justin Kirk of Weeds. Here's Mercurio D. Rivera. Thanks for that uh, amazing introduction, Matt. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, I've co-hosted here a number of times, and I have to say it's still a tremendous honor to be asked to read here. Um, and um, as Matt pointed out, uh, my novel is a, what they call a mosaic novel, which is um, it's a mosaic novel, which means it's basically 11 interconnected uh, stories set in the same universe involving the Worgans, as, as Matt so capably described. Um, uh, the story I'm about to read to you is about a man tracking down his wife across the solar system after she leaves him for another man. Um, so let me, it's called In the Harsh Glow of Its Incandescent Beauty. Our seed ship landed at the airstrip near Axelis Colony, where I was sure my wife, Miranda, had arrived a month ago with Rossi. Joriander and Hexa, my Worgen minders, hauled my bags down our seed ship's ramp while I hugged my hooded fur coat tight. Neptune hovered high in the pale viridian sky. Even with the Worgen force field doming this airstrip, Trident's tenuous atmosphere still managed a bitter breeze that stung my face like razors. The three of us trudged across the empty tarmac toward the terminal entranceway. To our left, the towering cathedral-like glaciers of, Titans, of Triton's North Pole glittered blue-green, capturing Neptune's luminescence. Here, Maxwell, Hexa said, removing a leathery scarf and exposing her scaled face to the elements. She threw it around my shoulders and pressed close to me, too close, I thought, for a few seconds longer than necessary. Joriander followed suit, removing his temp mitts and offering them to me. I resisted the urge to slap the gloves to the ground. Knock it off, I'm fine. The worgans stooped their shoulders at my curtness, and I felt a pang of guilt. They continued their steady gait at my side. The ground rumbled, and a geyser exploded on the horizon, spewing ice lava kilometers into the sky. Oh, the distances you've traveled, Miranda, I thought. He's taken you so far from home, but don't worry, I'm here now. After a few paces, Hexa placed her four-fingered hand on my shoulder, letting it linger there. I wish my people could have produced a more effective field over this area, one that could generate more comfortable temperatures for humans. I apologize. No need, I said, shrugging off her hands. After all, where would we be without you? Digging caves on equatorial Mars, I thought. Worgen Field Tech had opened up every planetesimal in the solar system to human colonization. The limitations of temperature, radiation, gravity, and atmosphere all conquered in one fell swoop. Without their help, I would never have obtained the transport to Triton to track down Miranda and bring her home. Joriander removed a jewel-encrusted sphere from his inside robe pocket and tapped several of the gemstones. In response, the terminal's circular doorway irised open and we entered a cavernous holding area. As soon as the door rumbled shut, a dozen mantis-like bots skittered towards us. They herded us into an enormous decontamination pen where they scanned our retinas, 
removed and sterilized our clothes and ran us through a battery of tests to screen for contagious diseases. I caught the Worgens staring at me with rapt attention, their large mooning eyes probing my body. I cut my hands over my crotch. Despite the Worgens' notorious reticence to discuss their sexual practices, they showed no bashfulness at their own nakedness. They were squat, husky, with reptilian scales speckling their bleached white skin and no visible genitalia. Hexa, the female, matched my height, while Joriander, the male, stood half a meter shorter. Rumor had it their sexual organs lay hidden within their flat-topped craniums, which they kept covered even now with a leafy headdress. I shuddered. For all of the organs courtesies, I still felt an instinctive aversion toward them. But they offered us so much, and I had to do whatever necessary to save Miranda. One of the bots injected a tracker into my earlobe. Local officials carefully monitored all new arrivals, a practice I was counting on to find Miranda among the hundreds of thousands of Exolus's inhabitants. The bots then sprayed our naked bodies with a microfilament that produced an electrical field evident only by the faintest of blue tinges. This will maintain your body temperature at a more comfortable level, Jory Hander said. You won't need the heavier protective clothing anymore. I turned away and donned the standard two-piece blue uniform provided to us, feeling the worgen's eyes on my back. The bots proceeded to guide us to a raised monorail where the three of us boarded a private rail car headed to Axelis. We sped above smooth, dark green ice plains formed over millions of years by a slurry of water and ammonia. As the minutes turned to hours, the topography below us shifted to a landscape of what I'd heard described as cantaloupe skin, an endless expanse of circular depression separated by deep rounded ridges. Ahead of us, Neptune crept across the skyline, growing smaller as it moved to the west, but still filling a, filling a quarter of the sky. The massive storm system of the great dark spot stained its southern hemisphere behind half-formed rings. A spectacular sight, isn't it? Hexa said, leaning towards me. What did you think, Miranda, I thought, when you saw these alien vistas? Were you in Rossi's arms then? How much had his neuromone worked your, th your thinking? The rail car wound around the bend between two icy mountain peaks. Then all at once, Excellus came into view. The settlement sat in the thousand mile Great Gulch, a valley of low neon lit hills beneath a silver, a, sliver, a silver web of monorail tracks. The blue wisp of the Oregon force field stretched from one peak to another. Below us, more than 500,000 colonists from Earth, Luna, and Mars populated Axelis. Joriander locked eyes with me in that intense Oregon manner. Did you leave it on the ship? He asked. I reached down and unzipped the side pocket of my bag, revealing the air pulser. No, I'll be needing this. Joriander averted his eyes. Now I'm going to skip forward because the story's too long to cover in 20, 25 minutes. But basically he uh, figures out where his um, wife is staying. She's not there. She's uh, in a different part of the moon. And they camp out. he and his organs camp out at this uh, location nearby where they expect her to return. Um, our joint venture pact compact with the Worgens required humans to work side by side with them on Triton or Europa or one of the other spaceports for at least six months to qualify for these colonization missions. The Worgens provided their tech to humanity, wormhole generating seed ships for intergalactic travel, force field devices, and low level AI bots that performed the physical labor. In return, we gave them our art, our ingenuity, and what they wanted most of all, our companionship. The Worgens prepared meals for me and supplied the stims. When they weren't engaging me in annoying small talk, they would sit in two chairs and study me silently. A half smile on their flat faces. They gave off a vinegary stink that made me gag. You're very diligent, Hexa said, very devoted to your mission. That's an admirable trait, Maxwell. I twitched from the stims. Why did Miranda leave you? Joriander asked. I had already explained this back, this back when I negotiated their price for using the seed ship, eight months, of my, eight months of my companionship. But they still couldn't grasp the situation. 
I had left out many details, of course. I told him nothing about how Rossi and I had served on the Worgen study group, the so-called love panel. We were selected to work with a, a committee of fellow scientists to understand the nature of the Worgen's obsessive infatuation with humanity. Rossi and I were specifically tasked with examining the alien's brain chemistry, a near impossible assignment given the Worgen's taboo against revealing anything to us about their physiology. But military operatives had surreptitiously obtained Worgen skin cells and body scans, which proved invaluable to our research. We discovered that the introduction of a strand of the alien's triple helix DNA into the cells of the medial temporal lobe of the human test clone caused a, a, a neurotransmitter to be gen generated in the amygdala, one that stimulated the firing of very specific postsynaptic neurons, the ones responsible for feelings of love. After synthesizing the neuromone, while we were in the process of presenting our findings, Rossi disappeared with the sample and with Miranda. It never crossed my mind he would think to use the neuromone on my wife, no less. I thought of the three years I'd worked side by side with him, the weekend swivel ball games, the times I tried to cheer him up over watered down drinks at Helen's pub during his rancorous divorce. How many times had Miranda and I hosted him for dinner? She's been drugged, brainwashed, I said to the Worgens, fingering the air pulser on the inside pocket of my jacket. Joriander and Hexa seemed perplexed. She doesn't understand what she's doing, Hexa said. Her feelings have been warped. When they remained bewildered, I added, I miss her. I need to be with her. This they understood. They bobbed their heads in empathy. She's my wife. Joriander and Hexa looked confused again. During our uncomfortable trek from Mars, I had tried my best to explain the concept of marriage to them with no success. The Worgans had trouble understanding how mere vows could connect two people. I had finally thrown my hands up and escaped to the ship's sleeping quarters for some rest. I'd wake up, however, to the unnerving sight of their flat, smiling faces. How many times had they stood there staring at me? My skin crawled. It's difficult for us to understand leaving after you've been joined together in what you term marriage, Hexa said. It's complicated, I said. Do you have to stare all the time, I said. You're just so... Jory Anders struggled for the words. Luminous, incandescent. It's difficult not to admire your beauty. Jory Anders' response didn't make me feel any more comfortable. The Worgen's unconditional love for us transcended gender or species. As always, I did my best to ignore them and focus my attention on Triton's horizon. I'm going to fast forward now again. <laughs> uh, eventually, uh, Miranda does return and they. Uh, he does track her down, and this is the scene where he encounters her. Uh, Miranda, I grabbed her arm and spun her around, her face blanched, her eyes widening. A long strand of red-orange hair draped across her left eye. She looked exactly as if she'd seen the ghosts of the husband she'd cheated on. Max, how did you... I kissed her cheeks, her lips, her forehead. It's okay, I'm here, I'm here. She pushed me away. What are you doing? I came to bring you home. She stepped backward. You've been drugged. It's a chemical, a neuromone, we discovered. The words came in a flood. I explained it all to her, how the single vial of the substance had disappeared the night before she left, how Rossi must have slipped the neuromone into some food or, or beverage she'd consumed. Oh, Max, she said. I told you to stay away. None of this is your fault, Miranda. There would have been no way for you to resist. You would have fallen instantly in love with the first person you saw. Max, I need for you to listen to me. She put her hands on my forearms, as if both to steady me and keep me at a distance. I know I'm drugged. She paused for a beat, as if to let the message sink in. Rossi confessed everything to me. What are you saying? I felt as if the floor shifted under me. I'll work on a treatment, Miranda. No, you don't understand. I'll find a way to counter the effects. I want to stay here with Rossi. Her words stunned me. I know I should be furious. I should feel victimized. But after discussing it with Rossi, uh, that's not how I feel anymore. I'm, I'm an adult. I'm lucid, rational, and I'm in love with him. Deeply, totally, unconditionally in love. I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. You're not thinking straight. She shook her head vigorously. Look. 
the chemical stimulates the processes in the brain where a person is in love, correct? In other words, if you compared my brain chemistry with that of a normal, happy newlywed, there'd be no difference between the two, isn't that right? Well, yes, but in your case, it's been triggered by a foreign substance, a drug. So what? Miranda, so what? What difference does it make what the origin of these feelings are? The point is that they're real to me. I'm in love with Rossi. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And what about me? A long pause followed. I've behaved unforgivably. You have every reason to despise me for what I've done. It's not your fault. No, I should have settled things with you before leaving, Max, she said, but I was too much of a coward. Maybe someday you'll find it in your heart to forgive me for what I've done. But right now you need to forget about me and get on with your life. I can't do that. Not while she remained under the, under the neuromone spell. Please, don't make me hurt you any more than I already have. She turned to leave. Rossi will be here soon. You should go. I hoped it wouldn't come to this, but I had no choice. I lunged and grabbed her from behind. Peeling off the synth skin covering my thumb, I pressed the dermaplast-soaked digit against the back of her ear. She struggled for just an instant before letting out a sigh and falling back into my arms. I cradled her as Joriander and Hexa approached. Maxwell, what did you do? Joriander said. Hexa grabbed M Miranda's wrist. Is she dead? She's fine. Help me take her back to the ship. We're putting her into space leap for the trip back to Earth. Joriander crossed his arms and wiggled his stubby fingers, a gesture I'd never seen before, but which I later came to associate with worry and anxiety. Hexa mimicked him. We walked half a block to the monorail line, passers-by gaping at Miranda's limp body in my arms, and boarded a private rail car back to the back to the airstrip. Joriander stood watch over Miranda's body in the ship's, the ship's med room while Hexa prepared the ship for departure. I stared out the plexi and saw the terminal's metal door were open, two silhouettes emerging from the bright interior, one human, the other worgen. Their appearance was inevitable, I supposed, given our implanted trackers. I strode down the ramp into the tarmac. What do you think you're doing, Max? Rossi flashed an angry smile when he spoke. He looked thinner than I remembered, younger. Somehow he'd managed to find the time to maintain his tan on Triton. As he approached, he pulled an air pulser from his bomber jacket and pointed it at me. Don't do this, the worgen accompanying him pleaded. The worgen regarded me with lovesick eyes. Don't worry, Albedo, Rossi said to the worgen. I won't hurt him unless he forces me to. He moved closer, his worgen companion shuffling right behind him. Board that, tri that ship and retrieve Miranda. But are you sure you'll be? Do it. The worgen crossed his arms and wiggled his fingers while striding up the ramp, disappearing into the vessel. I trusted you, you son of a bitch, I said. I thought I saw regret flash in his eyes for a microsecond. Don't play the victim here, Max. It doesn't suit you. Miranda's happy now. I'll make sure you're charged with assault and kidnapping. You'll be digging pits on Mars the rest of your miserable life. I don't think Miranda will be pressing charges, Max, he said. Not against me, anyway. I moved closer to him, and he jerked the gun upwards, pointing it at my head. Do you think I'm so stupid I wouldn't have expected you to have a gun, I said? Keep your distance. He pointed the air pulser at my feet and attempted a warning shot. Nothing happened. I laughed. My working companion set up a dampening field. He lunged forward and knocked me hard across the mouth with the barrel of the pulser, dropping me to my knees. The force of the blow made my body feel blink off and on, then disappear. Sub-zero temperatures assaulted me. I reached inside my jacket for the gun, the one immune to the dampening field, and fired. The shot went wide. At that moment, the ground rumbled and a geyser exploded in the distance. I stumbled and dropped the gun. It slid forward and Rossi dove for it ahead of me. I realized I had no chance of wresting the gun from him before he could fire it. Scrambling backwards, I raced along the tarmac away from the ship in the direction of Triton's towering glaciers. I sprinted through narrow, zigzagging pathways inside the pine green glacier. I made out Rossi's black bomber jacket far behind me, appearing and disappearing with each bend. The air pulses struck the sides of the wall, sending chunks of ice flying. I dropped, hugged the frozen ground, and waited. An air pulse whooshed past me, and the ground to my left exploded. Another shot rang out, and I darted into a crevice in the green ice wall. My teeth chattered. I was headed in a dangerous direction, 
away from the airstrip, where the Oregon force field would become more and more tenuous. After a few seconds, I stopped running. Eventually, nothing would protect me from the moon's deadly natural environment. There was no trace of Rossi. The sensible thing for him to do would be to forget about me, but I suppose he was no more sensible than I was when it came to Miranda. At that moment, he came around the bend, firing. My chest ached as I sucked air. I'm going to skip again, sorry. There's lots of action, lots of running, chasing, and I'll get to the part uh, where they finally encounter each other again. When I caught sight of him, Rossi's distant form darted into another cre crevice in the far ice wall. I leapt down the levels, my spikes crunching in the snow. I could barely feel my feet. Mucus had frozen above my lip. As I clambered down the final step, inhaling needles, I slipped and fell. My entire body slid sideways to the left and stopped just short of a, crev a crevasse two meters across that opened up into a black bottomless pit. I crawled away from the edge and found my feet before bolting into another steep-sided passageway. Like the prior trail, sharp corners lay ahead, only this time the path forked into multiple arteries, forming a maze. I slowed down at each corner, expecting Rossi to be lying in wait. I hit, a de hit dead end after dead end, turning and veering back, looking upwards to see if I could climb out, but spotting only glassy scarps that stretched into infinity. When I made my way around the long curved bend, I saw him. Rossi was up to his waist in an icy slush. He'd taken a misstep and found himself in a quicksand-like slurry, no doubt precipitated by the gushing geysers that surrounded us and filled up crevasses. I strode toward him, careful to stay on solid footing. This isn't about you, Max. It's about me and Miranda. He clutched my ankle. I kicked his wrist with my other foot until he let go. I kicked his arm, his shoulder, the side of his head, until the blue aura around him faded and his body field collapsed. He let out a gasp that turned into a howl as the sub-zero temperatures assaulted him and he sank further into the ice slurry. This was it, the moment I had waited for, ever since I came home to an empty house and a note in Miranda's familiar scrawl that simply said, it's over, Max, please don't follow us, us. And she'd expected me not to do anything? I picked up the air pulser, which lay on the ground several meters beyond his reach. My arms shivered uncontrollably, so I grasped it with both hands, pointing it at Rossi. I, I love her, Max. He barely got the words out through chattering teeth. I fingered the trigger. That's enough, Maxwell. Droriander, Hexa, and Olbido stood behind me. Scores of metal bots swarmed from behind them over the ridges of ice. One darted over my legs and crawled onto my chest. Another crawled over Rossi. The blue veneer of my body field blinked back on, as did Rossi's. What are you doing, I screamed. This isn't your concern. We've deactivated your weapon, Jory Andrew said. We can't just stand by and allow you to kill each other. It would be blasphemous. Stay out of this. Maxwell, we do what you ask, what your people ask, because we love you. His every word oozed compassion. All of you, you're all precious. You're all beautiful. It would be immoral to stand by and let you hurt yourselves this way. We want to protect you, to nurture you. He needs to pay for what he's done. I trembled, but not from the cold, and my voice, my voice broke. You're both suffering from frostbite. You need to be tended to. The carapace of one of the bots opened like a blooming flower and a syringe emerged, penetrating my thigh. Right, let's see where we are here. Uh, I woke to the muted glow of the ceiling lights in the ship's med room. Joriander sat by my bed, stroking my hair. I pulled away from him. On the other side of the room, Miranda and Hexa stood next to a bare-chested Rossi who was buttoning his shirt. I lurched off the table, but lost my footing as the room tilted. Joriander grabbed hold of me before I collapsed. You need to lay back down, Maxwell. The sedative the bots gave you won't lose its effect for another 30 minutes. He helped me back onto the table. You alien bastard, I muttered. Joriander turned away as if I'd slapped him. Hexa and the other word in Olbado accompanied Miranda and Rossi to the door of the med room. Miranda stopped at the threshold and looked back at me. Can I have a moment alone with him? She asked the organs. As they exited the room, Rossi placed his hand on her back and she gave him a nod, as if assuring him it would be all right. 
He smirked at me, a smile of triumph, and followed the organs. Miranda sat on the chair next to my table, her red hair draping the side of her freckled face. Are you okay? I didn't answer. She took a deep breath. Remember when we first met Max? We were on that climbing tour of, Olymp of Olympus Mons, and you offered to help me secure my rock lock, remember? When I met you, I felt the same giddiness, the same butterflies in my stomach feeling I feel now for Rossi. And oh, how I'd reciprocated those feelings. Beautiful women like Miranda had always been out of my reach, and when she confessed her feelings for me, it was as a, I'd been shunted into an alternate magical reality. I found it so endearing when you'd wake up with your hair uncombed and sit on the, on the balcony reading your red little messages until you were late for work every morning. She smiled sadly. But things change, people change. My brain chemistry adjusted over time and those feelings faded. I can't accept that, I said. What we shared was deeper than dopamine coursing through our brains. So says the man of science. She, she laughed softly, a man who studies the biology of love for a living. You've got it all wrong, Miranda. It's love that causes the chemical reactions in our bodies, not the other way around. I have to believe that. She covered her mouth and shook her head. Don't go with him, Miranda. I'm talking about us now, Max. She pushed her hair out of her eyes. What happened to us, to our passion for each other? Every relationship settles into a comfortable dynamic. You can't maintain that giddiness forever, I said. And as I spoke these words, I couldn't help but think of it in biochemical terms. The dopamine replaced slowly over the course of time with oxytocin and vasopressin. Intense passion replaced with feelings of companionship and bonding. I pushed the thought away. Miranda's expression turned deadly serious. There's something I need to tell you, something that I think you deserve to know. Her eyes met mine, and I could see a trace of fear in them. Rossi and I became involved about a year ago. As the meaning of her words sank in, I felt as if I'd been sucker punched. Yes, that was long before you two developed the neuromone. She paused as if to make sure I fully grasped the ramifications of what she'd said. Rossi would visit me whenever he knew you'd be working late at the lab. For him, you have to understand, it was all about the thrill of lying in his friend's bed and screwing his wife. The wrongness of it excited him. I knew that. I'm not stupid. But for me, over time, it became something more. I started to feel like a lovesick schoolgirl. Rossi would actually talk to me. He'd tell me about your work, about your concerns. The truth is, I couldn't wait for you to to message me that you'd be working late so I could be with him. I flinched. A stranger was talking to me. I'm sorry, I'm not saying these things to hurt you, honestly. And I realized it was wrong of me to leave the way I did without explaining this to you. I see that now. She took a deep breath and continued. After a few months, Rossi began to lose interest and moved on to his next conquest, and I felt foolish, furious. By then he told me all about the neuromone you two had synthesized. And I went to the lab one morning to, uh, to visit, and she looked up at the ceiling. Max, Rossi didn't drug me. I drugged him. I heard the words, but I couldn't believe them. She had to be lying. You have the drug in your system, I said. I checked for it when you were unconscious. She sighed as if that bit of information now required her to reveal more than she intended. You have to understand, Rossi loves me now, wildly, passionately. It's everything I dreamed of. But on the trip here from Mars, I started to have doubts. My own feelings had started to wane, and by then, I had already left you. I'd quit my job, I'd traveled across the solar system to Trident. There was no turning back, so I, I took the last dose of the neuromone myself, so I could reciprocate his feelings. I opened my mouth, but no words came out. She stood up to leave. When you surprised me at the catacombs, I, I thought it would be kinder to let you think I was the victim, that my feelings for you hadn't died on their own, that they'd been erased by a drug, but that's not the truth, Max. So I did all this for nothing. She bent down and gave me a light peck on the forehead, squeezed my hands. Be honest. You didn't come here for me. Not really. Your friend stole something of yours. You wanted to get revenge. That's what this has all been about. That's not true, I said. But even as I denied it, I knew she was right, if only in part. I confessed everything to Roski, and he forgave me. Of course he would. What about me, Miranda? What about what you've done to me? 
She remained silent for a long time. When she finally spoke, she said, after everything I've done, you could never love me again. Yet I do. A familiar tenderness flashed across her eyes, but only for a second. It's over, Max. It's been over for a long time now. You just didn't know it. Miranda, you know the truth now, all of it. Please leave us alone. Don't come after me again. With that, she turned and left the room, left my life. If what she said was true, if what we shared had died a long time ago, why did her words cut so deep? I staggered over to the porthole, Plexi, and looked outside. Rossi waited at the end of the ramp. Miranda ran to him, and he lifted her off her feet in a tight hug. The door behind me slid open, and Joriander entered. You shouldn't be standing up, Maxwell, he said, exuding concern as always. Where's Hexa, I said. I want to leave as quickly as possible. Hexa has decided to stay behind with Olbido, Miranda, and Rossi. She and Olbido have, are much more compatible for mating than she and I would have been. Oh? This was the first time I'd ever heard a Worgen talk about mating. I didn't know what to say. I'm um, sorry? Why, Joriander seemed perplexed. They make a perfect genetic match. In fact, they're already tethered. Tethered, I said. Joriander stared at the ground and didn't respond. But then I peered at the plexi, and I caught sight of Hexa and Obido. They no longer wore their leafy headdresses. Instead, a single rubbery cord extended out of Obido's flat cranium into Hexa's skull, binding them together. Obido carried much of the long, bunched-up tether in his hands to avoid tripping over it. So this is how members of your species commit to one another? The organ seemed embarrassed and seemed embarrassed by my question. Neptune had retreated all the way west and was now just a distant blue-green marble. A dark emerald hue filled the night sky. I'll never get used to the way that planet sets in the sky, I said. Millennia ago, Joriander finally said, breaking his silence, this world was an asteroid floating freely in what your people called the Kuiper Belt. Then it came too close to this beautiful planet, Great Neptune, too close to its harsh glow, its incandescent beauty, and got captured in its orbit. That's why it rotates in the opposite direction of the other moons. Joriander recited more facts about Neptune and Triton, but I tuned him out. I was focused on Miranda, almost suspect now, walking hand in hand with Rossi towards the terminal, the two organs trailing close behind. Thanks. Triton gets captured by Neptune, which is sort of a metaphor for getting captured by the, the one you love. All right, we're going to take a 10 or 15 minute break, and then we'll be back with David Leo Rice. So remember, please buy drinks. And we'll be back with David Leo Rice in a few minutes. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rajan Khanna. I'm standing in for Ellen Datlow tonight, who is attending Worldcon in Washington, D.C. Um, I want to mention that both of our readers tonight have books up here uh, that they're willing to sell, they're willing to sign, I believe, uh, personalize, um, you know, cash gifts, I'm sure, are really accepted for special messages. Um, but if after after the end of the reading, if you want to come up and say hi and buy a book and get it signed, please do. Um, I also want to say that I've been coming to this reading series for like close to 18 years now. And as Matt said, it's been free the entire time, which is great. I used to take the train in from Jersey and just come here and then go home at the end of the night. Uh, the only thing we ask is that you buy a drink. And if you've already bought a drink, if you want to buy a second one, please do, or a third. Um, and I will promise there's no judgment if you want to get a seltzer or a soft drink. I will promise for myself that there's also no judgment if you want to get a double whiskey because, you know, it's kind of been that kind of year. So, um, But it is my pleasure to introduce David Leo Rice, who is our second reader. Um, David Leo Rice is a New York City-based author. His novels include Angel House, the Dodge City Trilogy, and The New House, forthcoming in 2022. 
Drifter, his debut story collection, collects a decade's worth of short fiction and was one of the Southwest Review's top 10 books of 2021, as well as one of Dennis Cooper's favorite books of the year. He also teaches at Parsons School of Design and co-hosts the Wake Island podcast. So please, everyone, welcome David Leo Rice. very much for that. Uh, it's awesome to be back here. I think the last time I was here was probably 2017, uh, so it's been a very chill period since then, and uh, it's good to be back. Okay, uh, I'm going to read, I think, the two shortest stories in this new collection called Drifter. Uh, and the collection really deals with drift and, and drifters in a geographical sense, but also a kind of metaphysical sense, or people who are crossing different kinds of boundaries between states of being or between life and death or waking and dreaming. Uh, so the characters in these two stories really fit into that category. And in a way, you could think of them as incarnations of each other. It's not exactly what I was thinking when I wrote them, but when I was reading back through them, I think it makes sense to, to maybe talk about them that way. Uh, okay, so they're both pretty short, and I'll read one and then the other. All right, the first one is called The Painless Euthanasia Roller Coaster. Anders Luca phases in and out of the dinner party, playing the part of the lonely, barely invited drunk, though he knows it's a part he isn't exactly playing, until something rare occurs. A topic is broached that rivets him. Fritz Baumann, still in his 40s and already vice chair of the physics department from which Anders accepted forced retirement 10 years ago, mentions, casually enough, that he's heard of a young man who has designed what he calls a painless euthanasia roller coaster, intended to kill those who are in chronic pain, or who simply feel they've lived too long, with one last, theoretically painless, ride. A prototype has apparently already been set up in an undisclosed location in the foothills of the Alps, awaiting volunteer test subjects, Bauman says, while his wife pours him more wine. The conversation drifts onward from here, not stopping very long on this topic, as if all topics deserved equal attention. But there is, for Anders, nothing else. So he nods off again, into a dream of the roller coaster, his body flying around its gruesome but somehow painless curves, until, as usual, a pair of hands appears in his armpits and an attached voice says, let's get you home. And then, after an equally typical dizzy spell in a taxi cab, he's back in his damp bed, and then, a few hours later, in his usual seat at the Café Schober, stirring his milch café and picking apart his apple strudel while roaming from one headline to another in the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Until, this morning, something changes. In the back of the final section of the paper, where the obituaries and personal ads are quarantined, he comes across a small, ambivalently worded article about the painless euthanasia roller coaster. And he consents, even before he's done reading, that maybe, drab and shapeless and unending as his days have come to seem, and may in all likelihood, Anders is a man of science, a realist, actually be, maybe this is that for which I've been waiting all my life, in the obvious and moronic sense in which everyone is waiting all their lives for death. Yes, of course, he thinks, but leaving his few coins on the table and creaking painfully to his feet, perhaps in a deeper and more personally specific sense as well. Maybe here at last is something special, something in this world meant just for me. Over the course of that day, spent, as all days, wandering the old and drafty streets of the city, from the edge of the university where he's no longer welcome, to the alley of used booksellers whose wares no longer speak to him, Anders comes to see that the roller coaster, and nothing else, will be the culmination of his tenure on this planet. Suicide has always struck him as a weakness, not dissimilar to that of lying in bed all day eating sweets an option not to be considered seriously by full-grown men and women who have looked existence in the eye and recognized it for what it is. But the roller coaster seems like something else, a form of suicide too sophisticated to go by that pedantic term, an evolution in the science of how lives end, an option I would not have imagined possible, he thinks, deciding here and now to find a means of surmounting the line between idea and action, a means of consecrating his death to research, though he knows the real reason is more than this buried deeper within him. 
So Anders begins moving through the several networks of which he is still a tangential part, from one so-called expert to another, until he emerges a month or so later in a field several miles beyond the outermost Zurich suburbs, wearing a plastic windbreaker and the pressed khakis of the professor he used to be. He extends his hand to a surprisingly young scientist who introduces himself as Jürgen Trakel, self-proclaimed inventor of the painless euthanasia roller coaster, among other devices. Some public, he mutters with poorly affected modesty, and a great many others not. Anders' attention is already on the steep, wild curves of the apparatus, jutting upward toward the occluded moon, each loop narrower and more vicious than the last. You understand what this is, yes? He hears the young man inquire in the clipped, hasty manner of a scientist eager to dispense with formalities and get down to the substance of his experiment. Anders, of course, is just as eager. I do. The roller coaster, if it works, will kill me. All this, he gestures at the field, the stars, the Alps, will go away. Jürgen nods, clearly relieved to be dealing with so sanguine a subject. The torque of the loops combined with the acceleration of the car will pool increasingly more blood in your lower extremities, first your feet, then your shins, then your thighs, until, by the final loop, your heart will be unable to recover that blood and you will, quite painlessly, switch off. He looks at the roller coaster as if to verify that what he's just said about his own work is correct. Then he adds, of course, the Swiss government would never approve its testing. Nevertheless, following the opportunism typical of bureaucratic bodies the world over, they'll be only too glad to approve its use once it's proven to be effective, and, most importantly, painless. Thus, I've let it be known that my prototype exists and is now ready for the right kind of test subject. You realize, however, that we cannot guarantee its painlessness at this point in its development, correct? After Anders nods, Jürgen claps him on the back. Very good, then. Also, and this is my proudest achievement with regards to the prototype, a moment of euphoria will theoretically occur in the very last instant, a weightless interregnum at the bottom of the roller coaster's ultimate descent, as the blood is pumped for the last time out of your heart. A moment of, and please pardon the poetic phrase, ultimate mental clarity. You may well come to know, at the very edge of death, that which, had you known it sooner, could have rendered your life a success, if you'll pardon my bluntness in saying so. Jürgen wipes a tear from his cheek, and Anders has to repress a scowl. I'm the one about to die, he thinks, and he's the one crying. Thank you, he says. That all sounds fine. Now, shall we? Anders is strapped into his car, a lone rider in the vast Swiss night. Without human preamble, but after some mechanical stuttering, the ride twists up an initial series of loops, rocking back and forth, reminding Anders of the roller coaster in Turin he rode as a child with his parents in the years after the Second World War. The memory brings a tear to his eyes. The roller coaster tilts upward, gaining speed, then barreling down, twisting him violently, though not quite painfully, jostling his organs, raining blood inside his head. He finds himself wondering when it's going to happen, when, not to mention what, the crucial moment will be. The borderline that the roller coaster will take him across, such that he now begins to picture it not as a modern euthanasia device, but as a simple death train, dragging its condemned passenger to the territory from which there is no return just as there wasn't for the millions deported on trains during the years in which he was a little boy. But then he thinks, no, this mustn't be my last thought. These mustn't be my last thoughts, as they were for too many people already. The roller coaster knocks his head to one side, flipping him over, jolting him to the left and then the right, as his mind goes blank. When he comes to, Jorgen and his assistants are hovering over him, collecting his breath on a mirror, shining lights in his eyes. He tracks an expression of profound disappointment on Jürgen's face as the safety bar clicks open and the assistants help him to his feet. Running his hands through his hair, Jürgen says, how could it not have worked? We tested it on so many dummies, so many straw men, so many weight calibrated mannequins. Anders is in no hurry to correct him with the conviction he now feels, the conviction that he's wrong, that it did indeed work, and that this, all of it, here and now, is the other side. So this is death, he thinks, observing the scientists' faces as if they belonged to a line of sentient robots. I hoped it would be stranger, more foreign, the way I'd always pictured Africa before my fellowship in Cape Town. His mind continues along these lines as he wanders into the night, ready to walk for hours, indifferent to Jürgen's cries of, where are you going? Come back here. We need to test your vitals. Come back here this instant. Here begins a new phase for Anders, one spent in his apartment among his books and science journals and the bills piling up, all of which hold solely aesthetic interest, purged of all bearing on his future, 
now that he doesn't have one. Early in this phase, the Swiss government officially bans further testing on the painless euthanasia roller coaster, now that it's been proven ineffective. Anders has quite a laugh reading the maudlin interview that Jürgen gave to the Zeitung. Zurich instead builds a park and bike trail around the prototype, allowing the brutal metal curves to remain, having been recast during a dramatic announcement at Art Basel as the single most daring step in large-scale conceptual land art in a generation, and rewarding Jürgen, who has traded his white lab coat for the black t-shirt and leather jacket of an urbane artiste, handsomely. Anders can't help but smile at the shameful compromises continually made by the living in their insectoid desperation to persevere. With a feeling akin to fondness, he remembers the anger he would have felt 10 or 20 years ago when he was still alive. Nevertheless, he can't deny that buying a simple sandwich and a bottle of white wine at the corner market and taking the city bus out to what's now called Coaster Park and eating it beside the gleaming metal structure in the foothills of the Alps amidst the crying of babies and the laughter of young couples, some of them speaking German, some French, some Arabic, while behind them lurk young coaster enthusiasts, pale students sporting tattoos of Jürgen's sinusoidal design, is a charming and sometimes even transcendent means of spending a Sunday. On days like this, Anders looks at the loops of the roller coaster, each narrower and steeper than the last, and wonders which one he died on, where the crucial turn was. Then, going back over the whole of his life, he has the distinct feeling of being an old man, still living, faced once again with the roller coaster he loved as a boy, when he was small and fresh and full, both of life and the nation fear of death. All of it combined in the thrill that only this one ride could induce. At moments like this, he finds it isn't difficult to imagine how he'd feel if he were merely old, not dead, looking in wonder at the unchanged metal track he rode more than half a century ago, when Europe was still emerging from the hell of its own making, and he finds he can't help tearing up as he wonders how it could possibly be that he, an old man drunk on white wine at noon, is still here, while that boy, so much more worthy of life and so much more willing to live it, is not and never will be again. Except the good news is it turns out that boy is still alive. Uh, he's in this story now. All right, this one's called Jello. Jay's parents tell him never to go to the basement because there's something wrong with the foundation of our house, and if we ever went down there, we'd have to find out what it is. So for the first seven years of his life, he doesn't. He does what they tell him to, like go to school and carry the trash out to the curb and only watch one movie on a Saturday night and brush his baby teeth because even though they're going to fall out, his gums hopefully aren't. He doesn't like it, but he does it. He wonders sometimes what's down there, and if finding out might actually make his life better, not worse. But until he's eight, he resists taking any action. Maybe, he thinks, the life I'm living is the best one, if not the only. So he keeps going to school, where they talk about the Roman Empire, and planets, and paramecium, and pi, but these seem to be just words, or at best, pictures, diagrams, maps, nothing that can do anything. He starts to get sad. He has friends, sure, at least a couple, and they play in the sandbox with trucks and shovels when they're little, and watch The Lion King when they're a bit bigger, and The Dark Knight when they're a bit bigger than that, and they eat pizza and Oreos and play laser tag on each other's birthdays, but still the sadness grows. He lies in bed and looks out his window at the factory up the street, belching smoke, and he watches the garbage truck chug by in the early morning, knocking over the cans, and he feels the sadness drip down from the ceiling and in from the walls covering him up like a second quilt when the first one's already too hot. And underneath it all, at the very bottom of the house, he can feel something yawning, its burpy breath trickling through the kitchen, up the stairs, along the hallway, under the bedroom door, and into his bed. Something's waiting, he thinks, lying very still, unsure if he's dreaming. Something knows I'm up here and is waiting for me to come down. By the time he's almost eight, the dream has developed a new phase. He doesn't tell his parents or anyone at school, or even himself, really, not when he's awake, but it keeps coming like it doesn't need his permission, like it has as much right to live in his brain as the rest of him does. In the dream, the basement door won't stay closed, and the house starts to fill with thick, wet fumes like lettuce and meat left out in a pile. He gags in his sleep and spits onto his pillow, trying and failing to get the smell out of his nose and mouth, until he finds himself walking down the stairs tiptoeing in case whatever's in the basement can hear him, 
and then he's opening the fridge, rummaging for something to mask the smell, until he finds a metal bowl of leftover cherry jello covered in crinkly plastic wrap. He takes it out, wobbling in his arms, peels off the plastic, and throws it into the basement. It lands with a loud splat, much louder in the dream, he thinks, than it would be in real life, though he knows the dream is real, too. It echoes through the whole house, so loud he's afraid it'll wake his parents, but it doesn't. Instead, it makes him feel like he's in a house by himself, in a world without parents or teachers or rules, just him and the thing in the basement, if it's alive under the jello. As time moves on and his eighth birthday comes and goes, he finds he's having the dream more often, and now, looking forward to it. He begins to find the nights when it doesn't come unbearable, long, still, boring nights where he rolls in his sheets, looking ahead to the coming years and decades, the tests in school, the five paragraph essays, the work of applying to college and going to college and getting a job and finding a house of his own on another street near a factory with a garbage truck that wakes you up as it knocks the can onto the curb at dawn. No, he thinks, the cherry jello nights are better. So he starts asking his mom to get more, to get it every time she goes shopping. Sometimes she does, but sometimes she forgets. So he starts coming to the store with her, every time asking her to get cherry jello, simply saying it's his favorite if she asks why, which eventually she stops doing. She just gets it and makes it for dessert because, she says, me and your father are a little concerned, but we want you to be happy, within reason. So she buys it and makes it, and then she and his father sit back and watch while he eats a little, as little as possible, claiming he's saving the rest for his midnight snack, which she and his father say is a bit closer to being beyond reason, but is still okay as long as it's not every night. But it is every night. Every night, Jay sneaks down, in the dream or not, it no longer seems to matter, and takes the leftover jello from the bowl and throws it into the growing pile in the basement, listening to it splat and savoring the moment of tranquility as he hears the thing at the very bottom creak open. And though he can't yet see what it is, he comes more and more strongly to believe that it has to do with whatever's wrong with the house's foundation. He comes to believe that his house lies on a crack between worlds, and that this is why he's so sad living on this side, marinating in the bad breath coming through when he should be living on the other. By the time he turns nine, the basement is so full of jello it almost reaches the top of the stairs, like the water level in an in-ground pool. He wonders if his parents know it's there and decides that they must, but what can they say, really? Nothing, he thinks, as he decides that tonight's the night. He has dinner with his parents, listening, listening to them discuss Mr. Veach, his dad's boss at work who has halitosis and gave himself another bonus instead of fixing the damn copier, and he watches his mom make what she doesn't know is her last batch of cherry jello. He eats a couple of tiny spoonfuls, as ever, and watches her cover the rest with plastic wrap and go to bed, and he goes to bed, too, though he's too excited to lie still. As soon as he's sure both parents are asleep, he gets up, puts on his bathing suit, kisses his plastic allosaurus goodbye, and heads down to the basement to find out if the jello is deep enough. He's seen in the dream that he needs to take a deep dive, otherwise he won't make it through the passageway. It'll be too dry and narrow, and he'll bang his head on the cement and maybe die. So, at the top of the stairs, he gets out the bowl of jello, peels off the plastic, and hurls it onto the pile, listening for the splat. As soon as it comes, he takes a deep breath, puffs up his chest, and throws himself in, breaking the surface like a torpedo. He speeds downward, sucking jello in through his nose and swallowing it effortlessly, like this is the one true skill he's been learning all his life. It doesn't fill him up, doesn't make him sick, it just makes him stronger, helping him fight his way down, past the suspended bicycles and barbells and boxes of papers, all the basement trash hovering between him and the crack in the bottom. Swallowing more and more, he cuts through the jello with the sides of his hands and forearms, pulling himself downward through the dark red toward a glowing seam far below. As he approaches, it stretches open, glowing reddish pink, and he knows the jello's working. He knows it's doing its job. He closes his eyes, takes another deep breath, which serves to fill his lungs with cherry, and goes through. It sucks him in, spins him around, and for a moment he blacks out. Everything becomes distorted and hot, and he forgets his name and where he came from and why he's here. The cherry smell is gone, though the redness remains. He swims deeper, pushing his way through the murk, determined simply to keep moving. Time slows down or speeds up or ceases to apply. Perhaps, he considers, years are passing. Perhaps I'll be old when I get out of here, if I ever do. Swimming along once he's gotten used to this new place and let go of any effort to determine what it is, he comes to an area with a number of hovering beasts. Horses, crows, eagles, parrots, 
and other mammals and birds hover in reddish aspic, kicking their legs and scrabbling their wings, trying to break free, but not trying that hard. They look worn out, confused, resigned. Some are completely still, hanging in place with their tongues out, their eyes filmy and gray. He looks at these creatures and begins to get scared. This isn't normal, he thinks. This isn't right. Whatever's happening to them, I can't let it happen to me, and it wants to happen. The jello wants to slow me down. It wants to hold on to me. It wants to make me a morsel in its giant, sloppy gut. He swims harder, aware that his energy is limited, but determined to get out of here before he gets stuck. His stomach hurts now, and he can't swallow anymore, so he has to spit as he swims, pulling it past him with his eyes squinting just enough to see a bluish light in the far distance. Good, he thinks, anything other than red. Now he's passing people suspended around him, old people mostly, their hair white and their skin wrinkled and loose, but some young people too, with angry, envious eyes staring at him as he swims past. He picks up the pace even though it exhausts him, forcing his way toward the blue light, which shimmers brighter the closer he comes. He starts to wonder as he gets near it about what it might mean to leave the jello behind, about whether the blue is where he was going all along or if it's actually back where he started. But it's too late now, he's almost there. Maybe he finds himself thinking, his voice familiar in his head again. All those horses and crows back there, maybe they all got part way toward something, toward whatever it was that I too am trying to reach, but then they just... He doesn't bother completing the thought. He doesn't have time. Now he's surfacing, first his head, then his chest, then his waist. His feet are planted firmly in the sand, and he's striding out of the surf, panting, spitting ropes of snot, coughing into his fist as he scans the beach, which is full of families. Umbrellas, carts, screaming babies, flying frisbees, and behind it all, a row of cars parked in the sun. After he catches his breath, he begins walking along the beach, glancing at the families, wondering which one is his. And if none of them are, he thinks, unsure if this notion is strange, I'll just pick one, doesn't matter which, just any family that seems to have space on its blanket. As he's walking, looking at one set of faces and then another and then the one after that, he feels a hand on his shoulder, clamping down. He spins around to see a tall, thin boy in board shorts and an attempt at a mustache. Yo, Mike, the boy says, I was looking for you. Want to get some food? Mom gave us cash. He waves a 20 in the air and grins. Following the older boy, his brother, apparently, up the beach, the person whose name is now Mike feels his memory of Jello in the basement in the crack, slipping as his mind fills with questions of hamburger or hot dog, curly fries or sweet potato, regular Coke or diet. By the time his turn to order comes, he's made up his mind. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mercurio. I'll never think of Jello the same way again after your story. Uh, we're going to do something a little different tonight. Uh, this is our third month doing this, and uh, 21st month, if you consider our virtual readings, we're going to do a Q&A. So if anyone has any questions for the authors, just raise your hand. I'm going to repeat them into the mic because we're, we're recording it here for a podcast. Uh, anybody got any questions for the authors? Anyone want to break the ice? All right, I have a question. Where can we buy your books? <laughs> right, right here, right now. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't have an easier answer. Okay, you can buy them right here, but uh, are they available for sale on Amazon? Okay. Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Yeah. So, uh, can I get a copy of each just so I can show the beautiful covers to everyone here? Thank you. So we have Drifter by David Leo Rice, a uh, collection of short fiction. And Work in the Alien Love War, which is a mosaic novel, which is uh, all, basically all your work and short love, stories. Love collect interconnected stories. Interconnected. A massive novella right in the middle. Of right. Uh, great stuff. So thank you. Um, Someone, anyone have any questions? Any questions at all? Yeah, David, David you, your stories seem to have the MCs be possibly unreliable narrators. Now you're guessing what's real and what's not. Do you know or don't you? Uh, I'm gonna, is he dead? Is he alive? Did he go through Jello? I'm, I'm going to repeat that into the into the mic yeah. just for the the sake of the recording and people out there. So. Uh, the question is that Mercury D. Rivera sometimes writes no, no, about. Oh, you're talking about David. Oh, yeah, sorry. 
I got a lot of, I get, Rotate. there's two Davids. Okay. Yeah, okay, unreliable narrator. Do you, uh, the question is, do you know what the narrator is thinking? Why don't you come up here and answer that? Uh, that, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I think I only know what the characters experience. You know, so I try to like imagine how it would feel if something otherworldly seemed possible, but you could never be sure. You know, because I think often my sense about fiction, and maybe particularly short fiction, is like trying to give a concrete form to an underlying like hunch or kind of sense that you have about the world, then maybe it's more than it seems, or maybe things that we consider impossible are possible, but that you never really get confirmation. Like you just can't be sure. Even when you've had the experience, you still don't really know what you've been through, or if it was subjective or, or objective. Absolutely. That's a very good question, a very good answer. Any other questions? Yeah, back there. So the, the question is, if I can summarize, there's a sense of Americana in your fiction, and the question is, are you getting at something deeper than that, something more than, than the surface layer, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it kind of made me think that you know, the way that, like, consumerist Americana, like, like Jell-O or something you could get at the grocery store, also relates to childhood, you know, in a kind of rural American childhood, which I feel like is something I, I return to a lot. You know, it is my own childhood. Uh, I like this idea of an inversion that I think we tend to think of America as, like, late, right? As, like, the end of history, or, like, the authentic world was before, was in the old country or the old times, and we've reached this, like plastic stalemate or TV stalemate, you know, which may be true in a way, but I like subverting that by trying to almost invest like sincere emotional energy in products or in places or images that almost seem like they don't deserve it. You know, and that feeling to me, you know, it is perverse in a literal sense of just like going against the grain of something, but I think it's actually really important and it almost relates to actually a kind of like religious conviction that, that I have that like trash has a kind of spiritual potential, you know, or that you can't try to like look beyond a fallen world toward a perfect world, or I guess you could, but that it might be more interesting to look into the fallen world to see what's actually potentially quite interesting and, and uh, charged up with a kind of transcendent potential within that junk and within, you know, infomercials and malls and, uh, fast food and like all the stuff that we kind of recoil at in American culture but I think many times are also like secretly longing for and are ashamed of in a sense and like that shame is, is good territory to work in I, I, I love that idea of kind of like the numinous in the mundane and, and I think that's your fiction definitely hits on that for me from, from what I've heard and what I've read. Um, I, I have a question for uh, Mercurio. Um, so I, obviously I've read a lot of your short fiction and a lot of it deals with um, uh, various forms of romantic love or uh, relationships between uh, different people and, and some of it's forced and some of it's um, natural but... but um, it, it seems to me that, that in a lot of your stories you're exploring how humans 
couple, like how, how they form relationships. And I guess I'm wondering, like, what is it about that particular interpersonal dynamic that fascinates you? Because you've written about it a lot. And I, and I want to know, like, why is it that particular area that, that interests you in, this, in your fiction? I guess I guess it's just the the mystery of it. I mean, science fiction explores uh, mysterious things in the in the universe, and, and I, I can't help but think that one of the most mysterious things is love. And um, is it something that is uh, biochemical, or is it something that generates biochemical uh, biochemical reaction in us? And um, just exploring the depth of that. And, and one thing I like to do is um, um, take something small and um, parallel it with something big. So in, in a lot of the stories, you'll find that the um, relationship between the humans is something that is uh, paralleled in the relationship between the organs and humanity. So um, I, like, I like that parallel aspect of it, at least in the organ stories that I write. Um, yes? So a follow-up question, because I was thinking of this before Matt asked his question. Mm -hmm. um, to what degree do you think that a lot of the relationships that you're exploring are abusive? in a way, because certainly the way that they'll work and it's so easy to take advantage of them because all they feel is love. Right. And in this story, there is definitely a sense of emotional abuse, some of it potentially real, some of it imagined. And I remember that dynamic a little bit in some of the other work and stories I've heard you read. That's, that's you true. Read that into the mic just, just so yes, the, the question was that a lot of the stories involve uh, the abusive aspects of love and uh, that in some of the other stories that have been read, uh, that plays a large part in the plot. And absolutely true that I, I like that exploring that aspect of it. And there is a shift in the dynamic. I mean, these Worgen stories, I started writing them back in 2006, 15 years ago. And um, that's not all I write, by the way. Um, <laughs> but over a period of time, occasionally, whenever I write a story that deals with love, I find myself injecting the Worgens into it and writing, writing a story set in this universe. But um, the power dynamic does shift. Uh, when the stories begin, the Worgens hold the power. And over as the stories progress, once the humans realize that the Worgens unconditionally love them, they find they can abuse that relationship to their advantage. And the humans gain the, the power as the stories progress. And um, the, whole, I mean, the whole arc of the, the relationship between the Worgens and humanity is is, is sort of a big metaphor for a, one big romantic relationship. There's the courtship, there's the period of happiness, there's the big breakup, and there's the attempt at reconciliation at the end. Um, but yeah, I like exploring all those aspects of it. Thanks. Uh, a follow-up to the follow-up then. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> the, in this case, with, with, with organs, the, you know, so many of us would l almost think that this you know, this exceptional love of you mm. would be awesome. Or either as a creator and a writer, you get fan base or people who are out there in the public or the big fans that have their own stands, right? You know, for people who know the term stand, right? The, the idea seems very interesting that I would get this huge unconditional love. <laughs> but your characters often look at them and go, wow, this is really cool creepy, right? Because That's true. The idea of somebody watching you as you sleep, and, and, and maybe even though I haven't read it, I know from people who have read it, like Twilight's like that, right? Like, you know, it, it's, a, it's a bit scary when you get this unconditional thing where it's intrusive, right? Where you start to be like, whoa, whoa, this is a little too much. Yeah, there's no, no doubt. The, the question was that uh, at some point, does the love become smothering and difficult to take? Uh, some of the characters in the stories react that way. Absolutely. Um, you, you, you mentioned that as a creator. Um, do I feel that way? No. I mean, that's, <laughs> so that's a hilarious comparison, actually. But um, uh, the characters mostly react with an aversion to the Worgens and their unconditional love. I don't know what that says about us, but uh, I just found that, that for some reason I believe that reaction, that, that unconditional love is sometimes difficult to accept. Um, but um, uh, some characters in the story accept it and abuse it, uh, um, as you'll see if you read some of the other stories in the universe. But you're right, that, that's definitely uh, an aspect of it that, that I like writing about. But Okay. Thanks. I, 
I think the most fascinating thing for me in, in reading the stories was was the, just the variety of different uh, relationships that are explored within that, and, and and abuse of that love is one of the one of the things that are explored in his stories. Yes, Can I Roger. Ask a uh, for, for both authors, because um, you mentioned your childhood in the reference to the Americana, and you know, love you're drawing on relationships. Um, how much of your personal experience do you put into your stories, and and, and how does that manifest? I guess? Uh, the question that uh, Rajan asks is how much of your personal experience enters your story and how does that manifest in your stories? We'll just, we'll just very, very quickly I'll say that there's nothing more universal I think than unrequited love. It's something that all of us have experienced in our lives where you know you, you feel a certain way and it's not reciprocated. So I just feel that that's something that of course you can draw upon and readers will relate to, so, um, yeah. Uh, I, would <clears throat> I would totally agree. I mean, I think it, I often consider fiction as like a inner autobiography in the sense that you totally, maybe not totally ignore, but like radically downplay your external experience and try to turn your thoughts and dreams and like internal impressions into events, right? So I remember I had a very uh, formative mentor in college who was a filmmaker. And we were talking about Kafka. He said, you know, the real, just the thing that Kafka always does is the way he put it is literalize the subtext, right? So he's like, you know, you can have this, if you take the metamorphosis, you can have this emotion of feeling like a bug or feeling disgusting or feeling abject or feeling like you're going to let your family down or something like that. And all Kafka really does is just make that literally the case, right? But then once you've turned the character into an actual bug, the whole point of the story is to forget the metaphor and describe it as an actual situation. And I think that idea really stuck with me, you know, and to therefore be almost as objective as you can be about an idea that starts from like the most subjective or kind of, you know, fantastical point of view in there. You know, to use that word of, of like perversion again, it's like you're kind of working, you're pushing each of those tendencies against each other. So it's a kind of realist mode based on a fundamentally either surrealist or just kind of absurdist concept. And that to me has felt like a very productive and, and fun and sort of um, satisfying way to work. And to, and to know myself through that. I mean, I, I think that's, a lot of ways the power of, of speculative fiction in general is just taking the metaphors and making them real and then it, it amplifies the, the, that particular situation especially like on an emotional gut level and a lot of times we don't even necessarily realize consciously how it's affecting us but it, it definitely affects us. Um, any more questions before we, we close for the night? Anybody else? All right well um, I really just want to thank everyone for coming tonight in person this was this was great i i know that uh in these covid times coming to an in-person thing is, is not necessarily easiest but so i really appreciate everyone coming out um we we appreciate it uh please uh check out mercurio de rivera's books and david leo rice's books uh their books are for sale here uh you can get them signed or on your favorite bookstore and uh we'll be here next month with uh, uh, Tony Anyabuchi and Sarah Pinsker. So we hope you'll join us for that. Happy holidays, happy new year, and please buy drinks and, and support the bar. So thank you all. So see you next month. You have been listening to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB reading series. Check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening and see you next month.